Shall we pray? Father, thank you for this time. Open our hearts to your word. Allow us to enjoy the presence of your spirit. In the blessed name of Jesus we pray and all God's people said. Amen. So we're in 1 Peter chapter 1. And I know that uh, on your notes it says 10 through 12. It's actually 6 through 12. But that's okay. We'll, we'll deal with that in this. So, I think it, it, it is an absolute marvelous reality that was re introduced to us in verses 1 and 2, right? To be chosen according to the foreknowledge of God and by the sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit. Then in verses 3 through 5, he shows the inheritance reserved for us that cannot lose its value. And he gives us a reason to rejoice in troubled times. Boy, I tell you what, we, we need that, right? And in, in that, in verses 6 through 9, affirms the greatness of our salvation through verse 12. So all of that's kind of an outline of things. And, and those first two weeks, we, we looked at... Uh, the, the theology of God, the doctrine of God, and then the whole aspect of uh, being able to realize that God has given us an inheritance that allows us to know that regardless of what we go through in this life now, our best life is yet to come. And it's kind of important for us, and I realize that Peter was sending this out to those that were scattered throughout the Roman Empire because of persecution. And we look at it and we go, oh, you know what, things are, you know, we, we live in America, everything's kind of nice and everything, but we need to understand that little by little, Christians are being persecuted more and more. And sometimes it's subtle, and sometimes it's not so subtle. And we need to realize that the trend is toward being anti-Christian. It's, it's interesting as I listened to a bad podcast the other day that uh, every voice is allowed to voice its opinion except Christianity. We don't want to hear from that. We want to hear everybody else's voice, but we don't want to hear that. So uh, it, it's... It's changing, the times are changing, the atmosphere is changing, the culture is changing. And the, the, the country we lived in 10 years ago is not the country we live in today. A lot of things are going on. We need to be aware of the fact that things are gradually moving in this direction. So, it's part of, of, of my ministry and my job as your pastor to not just teach you the Word of God, but to prepare you, to disciple you, to, to help you be prepared for what's happening in the world today so that we can live as God intended us to live and be aware of what's going to happen when you do. And so that's kind of an important thing for me. It, it, it's always been something that, that's been important to me to not just teach the Word of God, not just provide you an understanding of the Word of God, but to prepare you uh, to be able to live uh, for God. And so we that's why I kind of wanted to go back to, to 1 Peter uh, and, and look at some of these things, because the same stuff that Peter is telling the, the Christians that have uh, fled to various parts of the Roman Empire, uh, that they're going through understanding how to enjoy being a believer in the midst of difficulty and tough times uh, is what we need, you know, today. So in that light, and as we've looked at that, I also want to look at these next few verses that kind of <coughs> help us understand the joy of our salvation. Peter says, in this you greatly, what? Rejoice. Rejoice. 
Though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials, that the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So it, it's this, this thing, you know, we need to be able to live in an attitude of rejoicing, and that's not always easy. <laughs> you know, uh, that's not always easy. But what we have in Christ is more precious than gold. Why? Because gold perishes, uh, you know, or the value of gold certainly perishes. Uh, the value of precious metals, of the dollar bill, perishes. And yet, we need, and as we go through these difficult times of our economy, we understand, you know, that. Uh, Gas costs more, groceries cost more, life costs more, taxes cost more. <laughs> you know, all of those good things that we enjoy. Uh, all of that is more difficult. But what we have in Christ is so precious that we can rejoice in the midst of all of that. And that's what Peter is telling them, and that's what the Spirit of God is telling them us today through that. And we might be able to praise God, you know, and to give honor to God, and to give glory to God at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Who, having not seen, we love. Though now you do not see him, yet believing you rejoice with joy inexpressible. You think Peter's trying to tell us something here? Rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, the salvation of your souls. How precious is that? We're saved. Regardless of what we go through with our health, with our life, with our family, with our difficulties, with our stresses, our crises, we have the joy of knowing we have Christ as our Savior and that we are His. Of this salvation, the prophets have inquired and searched carefully who prophesied of the grace that would come to you. Well, that's some pretty powerful stuff. Do you not know how great and wonderful your salvation is? That's my question. That's not in the scripture. <laughs> Do you not know how great and wonderful your salvation is? Have you stopped for a moment at any point in the day and just said, Praise God, I'm saved. Thank you, Lord, for the fact that you saved me, that you loved me, that you forgave me, that you came into my life, that you're my Savior. Because, man, without that, I'm crumbled. I'm crushed. I'm done for. You know? Thank you for that. It, maybe we need to, to revive that aspect, you know? Maybe make a, a pact with yourself that sometime during this week you're just going to say thank you Jesus <laughs> that I'm saved you know now, Peter points out the fact that what he and the other New Testament writers are saying is a fulfillment of what the prophets had deeply studied the Old Testament prophets they, they, they knew about God's grace but they didn't know about the fulfillment of God's grace and they, they just you know, they wanted to know more, and so they tried to find out more. The Old Testament prophets knew so much, just so much. Yet there was a lot that was hidden to them, including the character of the church. You can read that in Ephesians chapter 3, about the character of the church. They didn't know that yet. All they knew was Israel. They didn't know about the church yet. 
and, and the very essence of life and immortality. 2 Timothy 1, 9 and 10. They, they had a concept. Job had a concept of what this life of immortality was like. Enoch had a concept, but they, they didn't realize it until after the resurrection when they finally came to that aspect of knowing it, but they, they wanted to know. I mean, can you imagine how excited Isaiah, Joel, Daniel would have been to read the Gospel of John? Or the book of Acts? I mean, man, that, that just would have been, you know, what is the term that it is now? It would have blown their mind. You know, it, it, it just would have been overwhelming for them to realize, wow! I mean, God told us, and here it is. If they could see fully the impact of what they wrote by the Spirit of Christ, which was for us to experience the fulfillment of the grace God had for us. Remember Zechariah 12.10? We studied Zechariah a few months back. And I will pour on the house of David, on the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the spirit of what? Grace and supplication. They will look on me whom they pierced. Yes, they will mourn for him as one mourns for his only son and grieve for him as one grieves for a firstborn. Zechariah was prophesying about the crucifixion of Christ. Now you can go to Psalm 22 and get a perfect picture of the crucifixion of Christ. Yet they didn't even know what crucifixion was. It hadn't even been invented yet. It is important for us to know what grace is and what grace does. Grace applies to many levels of our life, not just salvation. And I've, I've mentioned this before about what the definition of grace is, but let me just repeat it again. Grace is God's passionate desire toward us. It is what He deeply wants for us that we are unable to secure for ourselves and therefore provides for us. Those two things. All right? God's grace is his passionate desire. It's what he wants. It's what he wants for each of us. But he knows that we can't get it on our own. So he provides it. All right? But besides saving grace, and we... we uh, I know I did a sermon on this uh, a few years back about what uh, grace, other grace besides saving grace is, but there's, there's uh, empowering grace, right? Scripture talks us about that, about enlightening grace that Paul talks about. Emancipating, I like to stick with the E's there, right? <laughs> it sets us free, right? His enabling grace, his enlisting grace, and we got away from the E's here, is multiplying grace, all right? So, knowing that we are unable to secure those things on our own, God provides them for us. The grace of God allows us to have the opportunity to obtain that which is unobtainable by human effort. My salvation I can't earn. He provided that through the death of Christ on the cross, through the resurrection, through the blood of Christ. He, that, that saves me, that cleanses me of my sin, that his resurrection gives me the hope of eternal life, the, the, the knowledge that I'm guaranteed that if I know Christ is my Savior. That's kind of an important thing. I'm secure in Christ. He provided that for me. How marvelous that is, you know? How, how wonderful that is to know that he did that for me, that I couldn't do it for myself. I couldn't earn it. I couldn't work for it. I couldn't buy it. I couldn't join it. He provided it through Christ. He empowered me to be able to live for him by the power of the Holy Spirit. That's God's grace at work in my life. Now then, understanding what grace is, that is his desire for us, and what it does, that is it provides what we're unable to secure by human effort, that helps us to better understand what Peter is trying to tell us. 
when he says, of this salvation the prophets have inquired and searched carefully, who prophesied of the grace that would come to you. Peter says, the prophets are talking about this. They want, they, they didn't know what that was going to be. They had a, had a, a minimal understanding of God's grace because of how he worked with them, but they, they didn't know how it was going to be fulfilled, how it was going to be brought to us. They wanted to try to find out the time and circumstances to which the Spirit of Christ in them was pointing when he predicted the sufferings of the Messiah and the glories that would follow. That's what they were trying to find out. That's what they were studying. That's what they were looking for. They wanted to know, what were going to be the circumstances? When was Christ going to come? What, how, what about the sufferings of the Messiah? All you've got to do is read Isaiah chapter 53 and, and understand the sufferings of the Messiah. Psalm 22, the sufferings of the Messiah. And yet, even though there are over 300 prophecies in the Old Testament concerning the Messiah, who would be the savior of the world? They covered the line of his ancestors, where he would be born, where he would live, how he would... Did you know that? All that's in the Old Testament. Telling us who his ancestors are, where he was going to be born, where he would live, how he would die, victory over death, the sending of the Holy Spirit, his coming again, his earthly kingdom. It's all there, including... They would tell of his intense and gruesome sufferings, which everyone seemed to ignore and were taken by surprise when Jesus was crucified. And here they all were, you know, his disciples even, there they all were just totally in surprise. Oh, wow, man, we never thought. What do you mean you never thought? It was all there. you in on something. When Christ comes again, everybody's going to be surprised again, even though the Bible tells us it's going to happen. You know? Everybody's going to go, oh, I didn't see that coming. Why not? <laughs> I mean, we look around us now and we can see so clearly that we are in the last times that Christ is coming soon. I mean, it's just so evident. And uh, it, it's amazing. I think when the rapture takes place, everybody's going to go, oh, oh, what was that? When I say everybody, I'm talking about people that were raised in church that never accepted Christ as Savior, who uh, heard messages on the rapture, who knew that Christ was coming, that, you know, hurt and still didn't accept Christ as Savior, and all of a sudden they look around and they go, oh, wow, where did mom and dad go? Oh, wow, where, where did uncle and aunt go? Oh, wow, where did the kids, you know, and suddenly, oh, wow, I guess that it was true, <laughs> you know? Um, so we need to, to understand that God does want us to be surprised so he gives us everything we need to know about the fact that he is coming and everything that is leading up to it and we're right in the middle of it so that's kind of cool Isaiah 50 verse 6 says I gave my back to the smiters and my cheeks to them that plucked off the hair I hid not my face from shame and spitting 700 years before this took place, Isaiah is telling him what's going to happen. Psalm 22, I am poured out like water and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax that is melted in the midst of my bowels. My strength is dried up like a potsherd and my tongue cleaveth to my jaws and that has brought me into the dust of death. It's all there. All there. Christ said, I don't want you to be surprised. God says, I don't want you to be surprised. I want you to know it when you see it. I want you to know it when you see it. This is exactly what I told you it was. Glory 
joys that would follow the sufferings of Christ would include the resurrection, the coming of the Holy Spirit, and the Messianic Kingdom. Peter says to us that they searched and they studied and they wanted to know more than was given them, but they were keenly aware that it was not for their time, but ours. Here, listen to what Peter says. To them it was revealed, this is the next couple of verses, to them it was revealed that not to themselves, but to us they were ministering the things which now have been reported to you. The apostles were first-hand witnesses of the very things the prophets predicted, and Peter reminds us that they reported those very same things. Salvation is great, amen, and marvelous and wonderful because it is the primary theme of the prophet's study. We need to know this. We need to know this. What's going on here? And then in verse 11, they sought to know what? What person, what time, and the details of the very things they wrote about. So the Spirit of God, he, he, he's telling them to write this stuff. And so they write this stuff, and they go, what is this stuff? <laughs> I want to know more. I want to know more. You know? And secondly, salvation is grace because, great is because it's a theme of the Holy Spirit's inspiration. Right? That's what it says. It says in verse 11, the Spirit of Christ within them that was indicating as he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the glories to follow. So, the theme of the prophet study, and the theme of the Spirit's inspiration. All of the sal our salvation that we have today, that they had to believe in what Christ was going to do. All right, They had to believe in what Messiah was going to accomplish. They, they weren't there yet. 700 years before, they had to believe in what was going to happen. You know, a couple thousand years in the time of Enoch, he had to know exactly several, four, maybe 4,000 years ago when Job was writing. He said, look, here it is. Here it is. I know my Redeemer liveth, Job says. How does Job know that? He wanted to know more. Thirdly, he comments on the greatness of salvation because it was the theme of the Apostles' Proclamation. That's the life and message announced through those who preach the gospel, the theme of the prophet study, the theme of the Spirit's inspiration, the theme of the Apostles' proclamation was the marvelous, wonderful message of salvation. It's good stuff. It's important stuff. It's powerful stuff. People will at least have their interest piqued by those who live the joy of their salvation more than just those who speak the message of salvation. <clears throat> if they see the reality of it, they still might not accept it, but it will pique their interest because they go, wow, this must really mean something to you. Even though I'm not willing to, you know, that's just not my thing. <laughs> I've heard people say that. That's just not my thing. But they at least begin to realize that it's real to you. Now, how important is that? Well, because someday, at some point, the Spirit of God is going to knock them upside the head 
and they're going to come to a moment of what I call a moment of crisis, which means they're going to have to cross one side of the road or the other. And they're either going to accept it or eternally reject it. It's a tough decision to make, but they'll come to that point because they see the reality of it. Then finally, the theme of the angel's interest. Oh, we love angels, right? <laughs> you know, we love angels. Yeah. I'll have to do a sermon on angels sometime. You know, different kinds of angels. Too. Not just one type. There's three or four or five different kinds of levels, ranks, and all kinds of cool stuff um, of angels and all the things that they do. The word angel itself means, angelos, means messenger. Right? They, they're, they're God's created messengers to God's created image, us. So they're all over the place. You know, it's kind of cool. But they had an interest in us. They long to look into the greatness of salvation. The angels are totally aware of God's plan. All right? Because they're eternal beings. So they, they know all about God's plan. So they are watching everything that's going on, you know, kind of like kids who like to watch things. They are just watching to see how his plan is working and how it's working in our lives. In 1 Corinthians 4 9, Ephesians 3.10, 1 Timothy 3 16, likewise. The picture of the supernatural world eagerly observing God's program of human redemption. You can look all those up and spend some time there. That's cool. The concept seems grounded in the words that Jesus had in Luke chapter 15, where angels are said to rejoice over one repentant sinner. When somebody comes to know Christ, when they repent and come to know Christ, there's a party in heaven. All right? So they get, they just rejoice. I wish we could hear that. Wouldn't it, wouldn't it be great if we could hear that, you know, when somebody gets saved and all of a sudden we hear this, you know, rejoicing in heaven. You know, we could, remember that, oh, what was, what was the name of that old movie where it talked about the, you know, when you hear bells, it's, it's angel, so wonderful their wings. Huh? It's a wonderful life. It's a wonderful life. Yeah, don't you watch it? We watch it every year. Right? <laughs> so, so instead of the bell ringing, you know, when somebody gets saved, we can hear the, the, that'd be cool. <laughs> Over one repentant sinner. This plan of God redeems sinners by the blood of Christ is so wonderful, so amazing, so great, that even the angels find themselves unable to keep from watching and looking in to it. The prophets foretold, the apostles proclaimed, the Spirit inspired us to share the same gospel message of how a great a salvation we enjoy. How marvelous, how wonderful is my salvation and the Savior who provided it for me. So we pray. Father, thank you. Thank you for the truth of your word, of your message, of your salvation, powerful message of your death on the cross, of your death and your burial and your resurrection, the power of that resurrection that overcame all sin, that we would just put our faith in you and accept you as our Savior, allow the cleansing blood of Christ to be our forgiveness and to allow the Holy Spirit to indwell our lives so that we might be an example to others about the reality of Christ. Give us that ability. We thank you, Father, for just the joy of our Savior of our salvation. May we, may we pray the prayer of King David who said, return unto me the joy of my salvation. May we be able to repeat that prayer. 
In the precious name of Jesus, we pray and all God's people said. Amen. Amen.